It's only a little operation. Maybe a new man next week. In the UK, some three million major operations are carried out every year. We're going to give you something just to take the edge off your nerves. So you're on the other side. But some patients' procedures are so complex, only the best surgeons can perform them. Starting on the chest. There is a very fragile line between life and death, and I know this because I've seen it. Adam Brooks and Royal Papworth Hospitals in Cambridge are world-renowned for their pioneering techniques to treat conditions that few others dare to take on. The surgeries we do now used to be the stuff of science fiction. But pushing the boundaries of modern medicine comes with great risk. In instant, things will go horribly wrong. And we're impressing the brother, he's arresting. The surgeons bear the ultimate responsibility. There's no room for self-doubt. You have to completely believe in what you're doing. Come on, guys, come to stitch, let's stitch. The currency that we deal in is the most valuable thing on the planet. It's human life. I hate to ask the question, but if this doesn't work, what would you like to do? It can feel a very lonely place. You're very much sticking your head above the parapet. This is what really happens behind the closed doors of their operating theatres. Excuse me, quiet, please. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If this escapes from us, we're in big trouble. He's testing everything up to the limit. It's a beast. When your back's against the wall, you just have to think, this is not going to beat me. Papworth Hospital in Cambridge is the UK's leading heart and lung hospital. It's renowned for its pioneering cardiothoracic procedures and treats more than 100,000 patients each year. 7am and consultant cardiothoracic surgeon Ravi De Silva is one of the first to arrive. True. Morning. All quiet? He has over 20 years' surgical experience. To be honest, I liked every type of surgery, but I suppose cardiac surgery, that was an instant love affair. It's like going on a date with someone. You, you find that you're compatible. I seem to have the aptitude to fit into the specialty, so I think I am best at, and I love most, cardiac surgery. While Ravi brings this passion to every life-threatening procedure, he also faces a dilemma. I always ask myself, is it going to make the patient feel better or worse? We have to balance those risks for and against a procedure and then come to a decision. It's very rarely black and white. Today, Ravi's surgery involves operating on the body's largest and most important artery the aorta. The heart pumps the blood around the body, but the primary tube in which it pumps that blood into is the aorta. It travels around the body, providing branches to all the vital structures, um, so it's incredibly important. At Royal Papworth, they carry out some of the most complex aorta procedures in the country, and this replacement is their most challenging. It involves removing two of the artery's most important sections and replacing them with a synthetic tube. I've got my letters so. still. Ravi's patient is 75-year-old Maureen, who's come to hospital with her daughter Sarah and husband Alan. Where is it? Have I found the right place at last? I've been all over the place. For most of her life, Maureen has been in good health. But eight months ago, when she had a heart attack, doctors discovered that her aorta was diseased and needed replacing. Well, Mr. De Silva, he was trying to describe it. I think I was so shocked, I didn't really take half of it in at the time. I wasn't sure if I wanted it, but I'm not the expert. I'm leaving it to them. Maureen's aorta has become so enlarged and weakened it could burst without any warning, causing her to bleed to death in minutes. So, all being well, okay, the theatre staff will come and collect you. 
about 20 to 8 and take you down to the theatre site. Her aorta, which carries five litres of blood every minute, needs replacing in two parts. At the root, where it comes out of the heart, and the aortic arch section, which has arteries that deliver blood to the brain and arms. Once these are clamped off from the blood circulation, the two sections need to be cut out one at a time and replaced with two lengths of synthetic tube, which will be stitched together. It's always the worst thing for the people yeah. looking on mm. to the patient because the patient knows what's course, going on. Yeah, it's like sort of... when we had grandchildren, you're sitting on the end of a telephone yeah. waiting well, to hear similar, yeah. something's yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> Bye. Bye. Mm. Thanks for everything. All right. Mm. Don't worry. No, no. I'll be all right. All right. I'll try not to. Yeah. Have another hug. Mm. <laughs> Mm. Oh. All right. See, see. See, see. Bye. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think it's took its toll on Alan. You can't be married for 55 plus years now said, and not worry about one another. We get on very well together, always have done. To be honest, I think it's uh, a younger woman keeps me going. Maureen needs the surgery to save her life. But Ravi has to balance this against the great risks of the procedure that include paralysis or a fatal stroke. As far as Maureen is concerned, she feels okay. She's walking around, she's living life, but she has a problem inside which we know puts her at risk. However, it's a big step still for a patient to undergo a major, major procedure to prevent a risk when they don't actually feel bad in themselves. Knock, knock. Hello, Maureen. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> How, are How are you, my love? I'm all right, thank you. Nice to see you. How yeah, are you doing? Yeah, thank you. Really, I just wanted to touch base with you today and answer any last minute questions that you may have. Right. Okay. I anticipate that we're probably going to be operating for the best part of maybe eight, nine hours. Really? When you're asleep, I'm going to make three cuts on your body, OK? for the bypass machine. Um, and then after that, do the rest of the plumbing with the arch and take away the... <laughs> what, the way you put it? <laughs> well, it, it's essentially what it is. I'm yeah, just I a, glo it is. I'm yeah. a glorified plumber. My yes. love. That's, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Um, and then we'll take things from there. Yeah. Any other questions you can think of? Not that I can think of, no. OK. All right, my love. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. To my mind, it's very clear. The one-off risk of the operation is in her favor compared to living with the enlarged aorta. So we're asking her to take a leap of faith and to believe us that she needs an operation to prevent a catastrophic disaster happening. All of the hospital's theaters are booked out for the day, including theater three, where Maureen's operation will take place. I wouldn't say I was looking forward to today, but I've just got to get on and grin and bear it, as you might say. Hopefully, you know, they'll knock me out quite quickly, so I won't know anything anyway. Do you want a freeway tap on that or not, there? No. Do you know how we used to... Um... No. no, we're going to take samples from this radio. OK. Working with Ravi today, is an aesthetist, Guillermo Martinez. Welcome to theatres. Great, we see each other again. We're going to come round this way. Right. Yes, we're going to sit you here. i let you know exactly what's happening when, OK? I think it's coming to be a lot in here. Doing really well. Well, if you classify the surgeries into a walk in the park or extreme uh, mountain climbing, I would put Maureen's operation in extreme mountain climbing. I'd like you to breathe in for me as much as you can. Great, you may feel more sleepy now. That's normal, in and out. Well done. This is gonna be a complicated day. You have to keep it cool. You have to keep all your knowledge on the table to grab the information that you need to take the right decision. Thank you 
50. Are we okay to start? Yes, please, thank you. Hopefully, Dokley, let's get on with this bit. Before Ravi can begin to tackle the aorta, he must stop Maureen's heart. If I don't stop her heart and put her on bypass before attending to the aorta, then firstly, all the blood which is coming out of the heart will be shed, so the patient will bleed to death. And secondly, the rest of the body won't receive a oxygenated blood supply. The heart pumps blood to every part of the body. Once it's stopped, the job of circulating and oxygenating Maureen's blood will instead be done by a mechanical heart-lung bypass machine. A tube in the heart will take blood out of her body and into the machine where it will be oxygenated. Then, the blood will be delivered back into Maureen through tubes in her axillary arteries near her shoulder blades. Ravi begins by inserting the tubes for the bypass machine. This part of the operation is tedious as hell, but if we get it wrong, this is where it all goes tits up from the start. You happy with the left radial? The final bit of piping that will take blood from Maureen's body into the machine has to be inserted directly into her heart. Starting on the chest. Back on, so can go, thank you. She's um, got a very thin sternum, this lady. No thrombus in the heart. Uh, Not that we that could no, see. We didn't see any. Cap leg over your forceps. The transition from a heart beating that is responsible for delivering blood to the whole body to let the bypass to take control, it can be a bit bumpy up until we can prove that most of Maureen's blood is coming out of her body, going to bypass and coming back properly into the big pipe. It can be a bit uh, a difficult moment. We are not in great shape at the moment. Uh, are you going to go on bypass or yeah. we need to bring her back? As heart surgeons, our role is to protect the heart and keep it healthy, and yet we are inflicting a, a rather abnormal physiological state on, on the heart. Flow right, right down. Flows right, right down. Certainly the first time you see a patient's heart stop, it's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. This organ is so vital to human life. Clamp is on. Lead is running well. Thank you. It's killed it. Stop very promptly. It's looking good. Good. Stopping the heart is only the first step. Now they have at least five hours of high-risk surgery ahead of them. Next door is Adam Brooks, one of the country's leading hospitals for rare and complex treatment. Along with Royal Papworth, it forms part of the largest centre for medical research and innovation in Europe and attracts highly experienced specialists like consultant surgeon Emmanuel Huguet. The currency that we deal in is the most valuable thing on the planet. It's, it's human life. I do feel an oath-like commitment to people under my care. In his 25-year career, Emmanuel has carried out thousands of operations. But today's surgery, a Whipple's procedure first performed over 85 years ago, is still one of the riskiest. The term tiger territory is used to describe areas which are particularly inaccessible and hazardous. And, and that's definitely the case um, in the case of Opal's operation. It's an operation that suffers from a terrible reputation. We only have to look back 10, 15 years and see terrible results. 
post-operative mortality rates of one in five, and often in very distressing, ugly circumstances. So now these operations are only carried out in a relatively small number of designated centers, but it remains a very complex and life-threatening operation. The surgery, which involves removing a large section of the digestive system, is usually needed because the patient has pancreatic cancer. But today, it's to stop Emmanuel's 72-year-old patient from getting cancer. We will just go through a few questions um, to prepare you for theater. We will give you Retired librarian Chris has AFAP, an extremely rare genetic mutation that means she's at high risk of getting cancer in her digestive system. She is predisposed to developing polyps, which are benign growths at various sites in her intestine. These polyps, over the course of time, can become malignant. And indeed, Chris underwent an operation for colon cancer back in 2007 and is cured of that. Unfortunately, Chris has developed another growth, this time in the top of her small intestine, her duodenum. Once again, she's facing major surgery to save her life. And just to be sure, um, you're not feeling any pain anywhere, right? I think my previous experience has taught me that when you're dealing with a big operation, it's no good trying to imagine how bad it will be. For me, the way to handle it is by basically making sure I enjoy all I can while I can. Can you please confirm me which are your allergies? Um, I'm sensitive to eggs, but I can eat them in things like cakes. I'm also dodgy with cheddar cheese. Cheddar cheese. I can eat Bless Wensleydale you. cheese. <laughs> okay. But I, I can I eat the crumbly cheeses. Chris is always a positive person, <laughs> looking on the bright side. This is something we've got to face, we've got to get through it. And I suppose t together we make sure that, that we do. To get rid of the polyp, and the threat of cancer. Chris's whole duodenum needs removing, and that means she needs the Whipple's procedure. It's a risky operation, because the only way to remove Chris's duodenum is to also remove several other parts of the upper digestive system, which are attached to it, and share its blood supply. The duodenum needs to be detached from the stomach at one end, and the small intestine at the other. Then the head of the pancreas, which is attached to the duodenum, needs to be cut away along with part of the bile duct. This is all removed, along with the gallbladder. Then Emmanuel will need to reconstruct Chris's digestive tract by joining the small intestine to the remains of the pancreas, bile duct, and stomach. The reconstruction restores the digestive system, which means Chris will still be able to digest food. So I'll be scratching. That was very gentle, that oh, scratch. Good. You're good at your job. <laughs> Thank you. Deciding whether to have the operation is a dilemma. Just 5% of duodenal polyps develop into cancer while complications from the surgery to remove that risk can be fatal. Trying to weigh up which of those two risks is the greater. It's difficult for us because mathematically it's not an easy comparison to make. We quite quickly get into philosophy of life. Some patients will understandably say, no, thank you very much. I haven't got cancer yet. I, I don't want your big operation, thanks. And equally, another person may say, what I don't want to do is live with this constant threat in the background of a duodenal cancer developing and then being in a situation where nothing effective can be done about it. Chris is prepared to take on the fatal risks of the operation because she knows what could happen if the polyp turns into cancer. My sister died three and a half years ago. When she died, she was waiting for surgery for breast cancer and my brother's experience was that he thought he'd got pancreatic cancer, but when he eventually had the surgery, they discovered it was duodenal cancer that had already spread. 
And while he survived the surgery, he didn't survive the cancer. So I'm very grateful to be having the surgery before I've developed a large cancer. Chris's operation will take so long that Theatre 6 is booked for the entire day. Uh, the reason it's a single uh, operation today is that uh, this lady's had previous abdominal surgery for colorectal cancer. So the operative time, we usually we say six hours for a Whipples, but with the additional adhesions Hello. a bit longer, seven, eight hours, so that's why we've left it as a, as a single case yeah. in theatre today. And try and lay down. That's perfect. Right. So this is the oxygen mask. And you take some nice big breaths for us. You're going to go off to sleep now, OK? Think about something nice. We'll be here the whole time looking after you, OK? And we'll see you in recovery. The first Whipples that I was going to do on my own as a consultant. I confess I was scared. Before the operation, I rang my grandmother to chat to her. And she told me it would be fine. And it was. Um, is it okay to start? Uh, yes. You know? Could the table come up a little bit? Please? Of course. Thanks. Unlike most operations, the Whipples is risky from the very start. Emmanuel has to make a massive incision in the abdomen and make his way through a network of blood vessels to reach the duodenum, deep in Chris's body. It is a hazardous dissection. There's potential for the unexpected, and it can go wrong. It's made me realize how fragile life is. I think the assumption that tomorrow will be OK is a very fragile assumption. By late morning, operations are taking place in all of Royal Papworth's theatres. In Theatre 3, with Maureen on bypass, Ravi can now start to remove the diseased sections of her aorta. OK, so clearly a dilated aorta. So clearly diseased, thinned in part. Certainly needs to come out. So we'll take away the disease portion of aorta. The surgery is so complex, it's only safe to tackle it in two sections. To do this, Ravi will first clamp off the blood supply to the aortic route. Only possible because blood can still flow around Maureen's body via the bypass machine. Then he can take out the route and replace it with a synthetic tube with one end stitched directly into her heart. He will then clamp off the blood supply to the arch, remove it and replace with another synthetic tube. One end will be attached to the descending aorta, supplying blood to Maureen's lower body, while its smaller branches will be stitched to the vessels carrying blood to her brain and arms. Finally, the two tubes will be sewn together so blood can once again flow through the entire aorta and around Maureen's body. Start me with the medium extension ready, please. Ravi carefully cuts away the aortic root. So diseased, it's twice the normal size. Okay, also histology. Histology. He now has to join the synthetic tube directly to the heart. Every stitch must be perfect to prevent a catastrophic leak when blood starts flowing again. Okay. It's incredibly difficult being able to stitch accurately. It's the mental fortitude to concentrate and be able to deliver that surgery over a long period of time. OK, thank you, Eliza. I'm going to give you this graph. Just hold it like that. The number of stitches I'd use in Maureen's operation, gosh, um, 
I can't even guesstimate, but we're talking in the multiple hundreds. Thanks, lots of squirty. Okay, and let's just pull some loops to begin with. With stitches secured in the heart and the synthetic tube, it can now be parachuted into place. There are so many steps that we have to be all right to have a good outcome that every little one of them, as you are passing them, is like tick, tick, and that's a sensation of relief. Thanks. Looks OK, yeah? But here's perfect. With the route replaced, Ravi must now tackle the most complex part of the operation. OK, we're going to turn our attention to the arch now. Yep. So we are ready when you're ready. OK. So I think this dissection around the arch is going to be the most dodgy bit so far. On bypass, blood is being diverted away from the route, but is still having to flow into the arch in order to supply the lower body with blood. The only way Ravi can safely cut out the arch is to clamp it off from the circulation. Her brain and upper body will still receive a blood supply because the bypass machine is delivering blood into her axillary arteries and from there it flows up into the brain and down to the arms. But the clamps on the arch mean Maureen's lower body, including her major organs and spine, will be left without any blood supply at all. Flow right, right down for a second. When we switch off the lower body, the clock starts ticking. Now we have isolated the arch. Ravi has just 30 minutes to get the synthetic tube in place and return circulation. Otherwise, Maureen's lower body will be left without a blood supply for too long. This state, known as ischemia, could leave her paralyzed. OK, we're going to clamp the uh, left carotid. OK, let me come down on flow. Down on flow. So if you go below 500, let me know, please. The patient is in a very vulnerable state. You've chopped out a bit of vital blood vessel. You're going to have to replace it if you're going to return the blood supply to the patient. So this is the most intense part for me. Cross lamps coming off this end. So you've started uh, low body ischemia, yeah? yeah? My attention can't be drawn too much from what I'm doing. My focus is a deep area of the patient's anatomy for a prolonged period of time. And during that time, you leave the responsibility to the rest of the team. It's not distended. We've got 700. Pressure is good. Yep, it's all good. I got the voice of the organs, so Ravi can concentrate his technical aspect of it, and, and I reassure him it's fine. We're fine. We can proceed. Don't worry about it. Sounds so good. You're happy? Yeah, no problem. No changes. I think we'll stay there for the time being. Yeah, so 800 on the head, 500 heart. Fantastic. Off on the body. If the scenes go well, and Ravi can implant the prosthesis within 20 minutes, Everyone is happy. Easy peasy. Walk in the park. But if he has a complication at this particular stage, we may be 40 minutes, one hour without blood supply. And every second of this hour, the kidneys and the spinal cord, we have no blood at all. If we damage the spinal cord, that would be a devastating complication that in most cases is irreversible. It's really easy to make this cut that way, sweater. Okay. So you've got to really be mindful that you're cutting that way, otherwise you end up with a really bad... Uh, yeah, pull that Skillfully, Ravi cuts out the large, unhealthy area of arch. Yes, please. What time we drop the lower body? One 12, 12 minutes ago, so 12 minutes ago. OK, that's good. Well, replacing the arches is particularly difficult, but I'm committed. I'm going down a one-way street. I've got to get this, uh, this completed and get there as quickly as I can. Okay. With the diseased section of arch cut out, he has just 18 minutes to insert and attach the main synthetic tube to the trunk of the aorta. OK, Sweater. Expose this 
Ottoman, so that's it, perfect. That's 20 minutes body ischemia. Thank you. So this is what I most worry. Every anesthetist in the world gets very nervous. But you have to keep the tension for yourself. You can spread the tension. If not, the whole room goes down, and you want to keep this sensation of control all the time. Are we at 25? Oh, my God, we are. OK, guys, let's expose that subclavian. I've just come down to 400 on the heart, just because the pressure is creeping up again. Are you happy, or is that...? That's perfect. With just five minutes to spare, Ravi finishes replacing the arch with the synthetic tube and can now start delivering blood again to Maureen's lower body. Right, we need uh, line clamps. Flow down, John. Flow right down. Give it the full beans. We've got a lot of air still. It looks good for the time being. This is when I come back to light, because this is my moment, when I need to ensure that we are delivering enough blood again to the lower body. OK. With the second aortic line, you can start. That'll be lower body okay. back on line. Just going to do it very slowly. Yep. With deer through the graft. It's a careful balancing act to make sure all areas of Maureen's body, including the brain and the lower body, get enough of a blood supply. We are in good shape, Robbie. Okay. Blood is getting where it's supposed to get. That's it. We are fine. I think bleeding is manageable. All the areas are responding accordingly. The sensation of relief once you restore blood flow to that particular area. It's like you can see the future and say, this is going to be all right. It's like flying a plane. We are flying. Fine. We are protecting this, we are protecting that. And we relax a little bit, waiting for the next obstacle. It's one step. It's an important step. But I still have to rejoin the blood supply to the brain. And that in itself can be a difficult procedure. Cool. OK. So there's never a sense of, wow, the job's done, you know, high fives. There still could be something untoward that happens that we cannot salvage uh, Maureen from. Even if everything goes to plan, open surgery like this is a huge assault on the body and takes weeks of healing. On the other side of Cambridge, a team is working on ways to reduce the risks of surgery and improve recovery times with the help of 3D HD vision and a four-armed robot. I was absolutely fascinated by science fiction as, as, as a youngster. I don't read much of it at the moment because I'm too busy making my own science fiction. <laughs> Mark Slack, a former Addenbrooke surgeon, is working on a new generation of surgical robots that he hopes will mean more patients can have keyhole rather than open surgery. I think it's worth putting in perspective what open surgery entails. The problems of, of the, the big cut is that um, more nerves are damaged, therefore there's much more pain. And I think people don't realise that if a large wound gets infected, half of those patients will need to go back to hospital. Why then do only 30-40% of people get keyhole surgery? Because it's difficult. Early surgical robots designed to assist keyhole surgery can be cumbersome to use. So Mark and his team set out to create a robot that moves much more like a human. The robot gives you a wrist on the instruments. The wrist is, is better than my own wrist because not, not only does it have the same flexion and extension, um, but I can rotate the forearm through 720 degrees, which is a scary thought for myself. Mark even claims his robot can help reduce the time it takes surgeons to pick up new skills, like suturing. One of the difficulties with surgery is the learning curve. And there are certain functions within that, like suturing or tying knots, incredibly difficult and can take hours and hours of training. With the robotic system, we can reduce the time needed to train a person to proficiency by about 75%. Now that has huge um, savings for the health system. Just 3% of operations performed globally use robots. But with this next generation now beginning trials in the NHS, Mark hopes many more open procedures will be done by keyhole instead, and patients will be home much quicker. I sort of get a glimpse of what it's going to be like in a few years' time, when we'll be doing all sorts of operations, um, robotically minimal access, than we're doing now. It's, it's quite humbling, it really is.
Back at Adam Brooks Hospital in Theatre 6, surgeon Emmanuel Huguet has made a 30 centimeter incision to give him enough access to remove Chris's duodenum. Before he can reach it, he first has to navigate past some of the body's biggest blood vessels, including the vena cava, which carries all the lower body's deoxygenated blood back to the heart. Probably get a little bit more exposure here. And a small swab to me, please. It's a very inaccessible area. It's right at the back of the abdomen. And injuring one of those blood vessels would result in a hemorrhage. So that's something which is in our minds the whole time. Jack, can you lift that up for me? Just there. That's lovely. Thanks. He's relying on experience and his sense of touch. It becomes almost an ingrained three-dimensional matrix that we carry in our, in our heads and the dissection of the area becomes very intuitive. We're just getting a hint of where we want to be just here. We've, we've already got quite a nice view of the duodenum here. Here it is uh, in its C loop and the head of the pancreas will be in here. So we'll start freeing this up. Having safely made his way to Chris's duodenum, Emmanuel can start cutting away the organs connected to it so they can all be removed at once. Okay, that's good. From now on, what Emmanuel is doing is irreversible. I think we're in a position to divide the stomach. The only way to separate the duodenum from the stomach yeah, is to nice. chop off the stomach's bottom half. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, that's great. So a little bit of using from that suture line. So could I have a 4 protein long single with a debakey, please? The most difficult part is the pancreas. Running right alongside it is a vein supplying blood to the liver. It's a major bleeding hazard. The portal vein is definitely one of the tigers and one that we, we have to keep on a very tight leash. The total blood circulating volume in an adult is approximately five liters. So if we're talking about a blood loss from the portal vein of three liters per minute from a total of five liters, you can do the maths. It's quite simple, but that doesn't leave us a lot of time to sort things out. Okay, so there's our portal vein. And I've got a little branch coming here and another one there. With the portal vein identified, Emmanuel can dissect the head of the pancreas from where it's attached to the duodenum. Uh, Owen, could I have a large blade, please? Could, yeah, I need a bigger blade than that. Just so in terms of position, let's do, let's do something like that parallel to the, uh, to the portal vein. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Jack, if I can ask you to hold that. And some water on my hands, please, Alvin. Now the pancreas is divided. Emmanuel can separate the other end of the duodenum at the point it's attached to the small intestine. OK, good. Now, after three hours of surgery, Several of Chris's digestive organs, the duodenum, the pancreas, the bile duct and the gallbladder, are free to be removed together. Right, okay, so that's the specimen. It's very satisfying when it finally relinquishes itself. In theatre, what happens is that, in a controlled way, we inflict what amounts to a fatal injury. So that's her first milestone, is a safe excision of the specimen. And then we put everything back together again so that it ends up not being fatal most of the time. By mid-afternoon, Ravi and his team are approaching the final 
but crucial stage of their complex operation to replace the diseased sections of Maureen's aorta. And then we can judge the length of that to be maybe like that. With the arch tube successfully in place, Ravi needs to join its smaller branches to the major blood vessels that supply Maureen's upper body. Two of these branches will connect to the crucial carotid arteries. Once off bypass, they'll deliver all the blood to Maureen's brain. All right, let's get on with the carotid. It's painstaking work. Ravi is trying to join a five millimeter tube to the artery using thread as fine as human hair. Each stitch must be perfect. Any leaking could be fatal. It's intense. It's draining. It's exhilarating. My attention is 100%, 110% where we're operating. Only there's a problem with one of the vessels Ravi is trying to attach. Just be careful, because this will tear, yeah? You see how fragile this is? So it's starting to dissect on the inside already. Just be really careful. One of the carotid arteries is starting to shred. Yeah, this keeps on sinking, guys. Don't know what's happening. Can we just put a bit of tension on that? That's it. And you're really going to have to pull with the lung and back as well. That's it. Its diseased soft texture is making it very difficult to work with. We plan for the more probable scenario, but then uh, the things can become unpredictable. Look at this guy who uh, uh, landed a plane in the Hudson. I'm sure he didn't leave in the morning with his plane, and so today I'm going to land in the middle of the river. But he did. And uh, this kind of operation is a bit like this. So if this escapes from us, we're in big trouble. No, it's not true. Cut through? Yeah, completely. Scissors. Ravi's only option is to try to cut the diseased artery back even further into Maureen's neck. The danger with me doing that is that I get to a point that I have no carotid artery left to stitch to. And that's obviously a, a pretty high risk situation for Maureen to be in. So somehow we're going to have to get a bit more length on this. Maybe just down there. Uh, I'm going to have to get my hand in there somehow. If the artery continues to disintegrate, Ravi won't be able to reconnect it, starving Maureen's brain of blood and risking a fatal stroke. I think it's important to look calm on the outside because the rest of the team will be distracted by you if you don't give that air of calmness and control. So it's a quiet, controlled level of panic, I would say. It'll be all right. It'll be OK. Let's see. Finally, Ravi manages to get the stitches to hold. Liza, could you have a syringe of saline ready, please? Thanks. And pull your ends. Thanks. Okay, looks all right. It's amazing how parts of the operation you get past the subclavian, you think, yeah. oh, it's going to be easier. <laughs> and then suddenly, Get kicked in the nuts by this carotid. Oh, we can take this fella off, can we? And then. After attaching the other branches to the remaining vessels, Ravi can now do the final connection and suture the two synthetic tubes together. Someone back there? Hopefully it will pull through. I don't want to okay. do too much, thank you. After nearly six hours in theatre, 
It's time to test Maureen's new aorta. Ravi's ready to open all the connections, let blood flow through it, and take her off bypass. Fill the heart a bit, thanks. Turn the white on. Thanks, you can take it off. All clamps are off. Flow up slowly, empty out. Lungs off, thank you. Should we drop a bit the brain to 750? Yep, go for it. OK, fill the heart again, switch the green off. Green's off, yeah. filling. Should we shock? Yeah. Let's get the paddles out, please. And Jules, yeah, we're yep. in charge. That's it, lovely. Should I ventilate? Please, thanks. Cool. We're in good shape, Ravi. Great. Mean of 60, CUP of 9. Maureen's heart is now pumping blood through her new aorta and around her entire body. When the blood is flowing to the places it should be, that moment is, is, is fantastic. It still does look rather amazing in the chest when you see all the, the piping going around. We are just glorified plumbers, you know that. such a massive assault on the biggest artery in her body. It will be at least a couple of weeks before Maureen is well enough to go home to her husband, Alan. Just down through this one? Yeah, down here. Oh, right. yeah. OK. And this one. Oh, yeah. OK. She is waking up, she's not mm. sort of got any medication that's keeping her asleep. Mm, We're okay. just sort of letting her wake up naturally mm. as she would. Yeah. So. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> You're right. Mm. Do you want to sit down? No, I'm okay. No. I don't ever finish an operation and think job done. I don't think I ever stop thinking about the patient, be it Maureen or anyone else, until they've left hospital, because there are so many other critical steps along the way that things could happen which affect the patient badly. Sorry, love, but you know what I'm like. <laughs> I right. apologise. Mm -hmm. mm. It's all right. <laughs> The more routine operations at Addenbrooke's hospital have finished for the day. But in Theatre 6, Surgeon Emmanuel Huguet has his biggest challenge still ahead of him. Right, so I've got a few ties to uh, suture off. Having removed Chris's duodenum, along with several other organs, he now has to reconstruct Chris's digestive system. To bridge the gap left by the removal of the organs, Emmanuel will need to reconnect the remaining section of pancreas, bile duct, and stomach to the intestine. First, the pancreas is reconnected. Although reduced in size, it will still produce enzymes to digest food. Then the remains of the bile duct is attached to allow bile to drain from the liver back into the intestine to help break down fats. Finally, the stomach and intestine are joined together so food can still pass through and into the lower digestive system. This is really very, very soft, uh, so we'll have to take great care with it. The most difficult organ to reconnect is the pancreas. The pancreas does many things, including the production of enzymes, juices that digest food, and these are very, very powerful substances. Inside the intestine, the juices are harmless and simply do their job, which is to digest food, then the inner lining of the intestine is designed to be inert to those substances. But if those juices make their way into the 
abdominal cavity, then havoc ensues because the juices do what they do, which is digest. They will digest everything in their path. Okay, here we go. So I think we have start with one there. I think the join between the pancreas and the intestine is the Achilles heel of this operation. Unfortunately, leaks pancreatic juice, pancreatic enzymes, in up to 15% of these operations. And so trying to suture the intestine to it can create difficulties in that sense. So that we will call the west. Let's put it here, uh, Jack. Thank you. That's great. And then the next one, please. Stitching the join is even more challenging because the pancreas is extremely fragile and crumbly. But each tie will have to be careful because the uh, substance of the pancreas will fracture. It's a bit like trying to suture something onto a lump of plasticine or cottage cheese or something somewhere in between the two that the sutures simply may not hold very well. How much tension you need to apply to a suture. You can't read that in a book. You can't see that from a video. You have to learn. I used to practice tying knots on tomatoes. because The skin of a tomato is very fragile. If you can tie a knot on the skin of a tomato just tight enough without tearing the skin, then that, that gives you an idea of the subtlety. There you go. Yep, that's good. So, Lena, we've, uh, we've done the pancreatic joint. That's yeah. done. Was it OK to join the pancreas? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, it is, actually. Yeah. Technically, I'm happy. OK, good. In this instance, it, it, looks, okay. it looks OK. With the pancreas in its new position, Emmanuel uses his careful stitching to reroute the intestine, bile duct, and stomach to create a fully working digestive system. Just checking we've got everything right. Here's our bile duct, and there's the opening on the bowel, and we've got all our sutures in place to bring the two together. As a kid at school, I remember sitting in human biology lessons being transfixed hair standing on end, almost mystical kind of experience. I was fascinated by why these processes might go wrong, and then it dawned on me what an amazing privilege it might be to spend a lifetime learning about that and, and intervening to fix those processes. Okay, good. Uh, let's have a little bit of suction. Okay, there we go. That's good. So that's our last join. Uh, between the stomach here and the, uh, and the small intestine. Okay. After operating for over six hours, Emmanuel has removed the threat of duodenal cancer and reconstructed Chris's digestive system so it should function close to normal. At the end of Chris's operation, I feel very serene. I'm very relieved that it's gone well. It's not always like that by any stretch. But on, on this occasion, we've managed to keep it on a very tight leash. We've, we've kept it under uh, control the whole way through. Chris? Can you hear me? Nice big breaths, it's all done. Everything went really well. Can you open your eyes for me? Two weeks after being discharged, Chris is back to see Emmanuel. So, how have you been? I've been all right. Um, we, I went for a walk around the garden yesterday. I wanted to go around and see all the flowers I'd got out and see what the fruit trees Fantastic. were doing. So, I yeah, bet that good makes fun. a change from uh, being in lovely Addenbrooke, hey? Mm, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> How's the eating going? <clears throat> Eating, I'm actually enjoying eating. I have a feeling I might have been almost being eating too much in the evening. <laughs> Chris has done really, really well. If anything, she's ahead of the curve. So, so I'm absolutely delighted. It sounds as though you, you're doing really well. Uh, and I'm enjoying it, which yeah, is yeah. probably yeah. the most important part of it. 
tests revealed that the polyp removed from Chris's body was on the verge of being one of the 5% that become cancerous. I can't help feeling with Chris that the decision making was a fine balance. It would not have been too difficult for both Chris or I to come to a different conclusion and decided against doing the operation. And that would have been the wrong decision. Okay, all the best, Chris. Thank safe, you. Ju safe journey. Thank you. Safe, yeah, safe journey. So I feel that we've caught this just in time. The sensation is one that is similar to what you might feel if, imagine, you're about to cross the road. You turn your head and, and a juggernaut thunders past you. And you, you take a breath and you think, oh, that was, that was close. After six days in critical care and just over one week on the ward, Maureen is going home. Certainly in Maureen's case, the balancing out the risk of no operation versus operation, then certainly I think that decision to operate on her was the right one. I think the operations allowed Maureen to live a longer, healthier life um, with the confidence that she doesn't have um, a serious medical condition that could end her life at any moment. Four months later, Ravi needs to check on her progress. But with the country in COVID-19 lockdown, they must meet online. Well, Maureen, Hello. lovely to see you, and to see you too, Mr. Marston. Where are you working from today? Well, today I've got the luxury of being at home. Oh, oh, you're, okay. oh. oh right. Okay. Well, I can't say you're lucky, but you know. <laughs> really, I want to just go through your case and talk about what's happened to you. No, we're getting there. Making the easy, yeah. You know, I'll do a bit and then I'll sit down a bit and yeah. then I'll moan a bit. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have to look forward. I think I'm pretty pleased with your progress. It was a major, major operation. Yes, I know it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think you should feel reassured that the problem which you had, that danger's now taken away. So I hope you feel reassured by that. And uh, no. I hope that gives you confidence going forward. Yeah. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking you and everyone else involved for what you've done. Thank you ever so much. And uh, we'll do as we're told. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, take care. Well, seeing someone go through a major operation and recover well is 99% of the joy we get from this job. It's a fantastic feeling and um, it, it's, a, it's, it's just the reason why we, we do what we do.